Welcome to Speechless. We're glad to have you here tonight, and most of tonight is going to be all things judicial. We have a couple exceptions to that, but uh, I just want you to know there is a lot going on in the judiciary. There always is, but I want to update you on the races for the Supreme Court, other district courts around the area, and because one of the things that I hear quite often is... I don't know who's running for judge. I don't know anything about him. I don't know how to vote. Well, I believe that's intentional, but I'm going to show you how you can't use that excuse. If you've seen, if you watch this show tonight, no more excuses for any race, uh, statewide uh, and potentially local in Minnesota. So if you're talking about uh, state rep on up, uh, there's no excuse for you not to know who your candidate is who the options of you that you have for candidate, what they are, you will know how to find out. And as of today, um, no excuses. <laughs> okay. So uh, other things we're going to talk about today. A uh, little bit on Dan Severson running for state senate. He's been on my show. And a, quite a surprise. It wasn't expected. Uh, but Michelle McDonald, who's been my, on my show, uh, who's been representing, representing some very, um, some clients with some very bad circumstances because of the judge, is uh, uh, running for the Minnesota Supreme Court. <laughs> and had a little bit to do with that, but uh, I'm glad to see that she's running and she got endorsed by the Republican Party, we're going to uh, hear what she has to say. And I, I, I misspoke. Dan Severson is running for Secretary of State. Okay, I don't, I don't know what I said before, but he's running for Secretary of State. Mark Ritchie's old job, the serial lawbreaker, uh, Mark Ritchie was. He pretty much had to step down, um, being forced out, because he's got so many lawsuits against him and so many rulings against him. So, and at the end, uh, okay, uh, there's a Michigan Supreme Court ruling. Uh, there's a U.S. Supreme Court ruling uh, relating to treaties that affects parental rights. We're one step closer to losing our parental rights because of the Supreme Court case. Um, Michigan Supreme Court upheld parental rights. Uh, just a lot of back and forth things going on here in our courts regarding families and I think we should settle these things once and for all and just get it done with instead of playing all these games and then if we have enough time it's the 25th anniversary of Tiananmen Square and there was a hearing in the House uh, Human Rights Committee and uh, I believe it's Foreign Affairs Subcommittee Human uh, Subcommittee called the Human Rights Committee and you had people that were engaged in the Tiananmen Square event testify, and they're now in the United States, and just got a clip of a couple of them, but what they think the United States can do better. Just fascinating testimony of these people in, in more ways than one, so I hope we have time to get to that. Okay, but first of all, and let's go to the computer here. Remember, no excuses, okay? You have no reason not to know who's running for judge and who your judge is going to be. You're going to have, find out how you can contact them or who you're going to vote for judge, and it's all out there. Okay, so here's what you do. Now let's go to the uh, iMac here. This is your computer screen, and you see in the top right-hand corner, there's the search bar, and you just start typing in. You need to find the Minnesota Secretary of State. Not a difficult thing. Type in MN, MN, and then Secretary of State. And there it pops up under there. You just start and then go down there and click on that. And it'll do a search. There's the serial lawbreaker, Mark Ritchie. But there's the website. You click on the website, Minnesota Office of Secretary of State. There's the home page. And then what's new? Find out who's running for office with our candidate finder tool. Hmm, there you go, right there, candidate finder tool. And then click on that, 
and there it comes down basic searches, state and federal office, state and federal offices without judicial, judicial offices, state executive office, state senate offices, state representative offices. Well, I haven't looked to see who's all running for state representative in uh, Senate District 43, so I will click on state representative offices here and just see what we know here, who's all running. And so there's District 3A and 3B. So we just go scroll down the list here to 43A and B. Now that's the Maplewood White Bear Lake area for A here, Mata Medi. So you got Stacy Stout and Peter Fisher, and there you got a link to their websites. Look, and you just click on that, and you got their websites. You can find out information on their phone numbers will be on there, and everything like that. And then in Maplewood, North St. Paul, Oakdale, you got Justice Whitethorn versus Leon Lilly. Whitethorn's got his uh, website there. Leon Lilly doesn't. Uh, so any area that you live in, oh, why? Wow, here's 44B. I don't know what area that is, but a lot of people. You got one Republican and three Democrats running in that area. Must be a, a Democrat decided not to run. Because I don't recommend recognize any of those names. I don't recommend them either, but <laughs> that's another story. Okay, so that's how you find that out. And, you, and of course, the common answer, oh, I don't know anything about the judges. So, you, so you, you, know, you go back to that main page there, judicial offices, click on that. And what comes up? A frozen computer is what comes up. Good one. I'm going to click on it again. Oh, boy. This is what we need. Okay. There we go. It's coming. So you go down here, right here in the Minnesota Supreme Court, and you'll see John Hancock versus, oh, uh, I can't ever pronounce this right, Wilhelmina Wright. Uh, and her website there, and David Lillyhog versus Michelle McDonald. Okay, so, and you can click on their website. Some of them may develop, may not be developed right now, but you can go and find out anything you want there. Um, just some, and, and what's interesting, there's only two, in the Supreme Court, there's only two races. Each of them had a candidate, but in the appellate court, for seats, uh, the seven races there, none of these have a challenger. Okay, and, and I, I'm going to tell you, it takes a lot of talking to get a person to run for the Supreme Court or the Appellate Court, because inevitably you're going to hear they got the word incumbent behind their name on, on the ballot, and it's just a very and then they, they, the, these justices punish you because you're violating an unwritten rule that the courts have, that the judiciary has, that you don't run against an incumbent. So the person that runs it against an incumbent, unless you have blood, the blessing of the bar, for some, whatever reason, the judge is kind of going bad, then you have to go, uh, I mean, then the bar is against you and the courts are kind of against you. You start losing your cases. Of course, when Greg Wurzel was on here, who ran for the Minnesota Supreme Court, he had a judge tell him it was a very bad decision. Yeah, I'm putting this in my words. Uh, it's a very bad decision that you made to run for the Supreme Court, and uh, you shouldn't have done that. And uh, <laughs> said that in front of his client, and he ended up losing that client because the judge, uh, I'll have to remember what, the judge actually said, but it was so blatant out there that the client knew that the judge was not going to be uh, beneficial to him. So um, Greg lost that uh, client and lost some other ones because of that. But that's the way the games played in the judiciary, our righteous judiciary that we have in Minnesota, our so-called righteous. A uh, couple races I want you to notice in the 10th Judicial District. Uh, let's see here. Okay. I thought this was interesting. Uh, let's go to the, uh, there we are. Okay. Notice this rate. Court, course, court 1, 10th Judicial District. This is court's going to be in Washington County. Susan Miles is a longtime sitting judge. 
she is also the um, part of the um, Minnesota Bar, uh, no, it was the judicial, um, she represented the judicial district chair, Jud uh, judicial district judges association and and would go down the legislature and talk about uh, their opinion on whether we should elect judges or not. Uh, I have very little respect for Susan Miles. I see this Julie Lafleur is running for office um, and we're going to find out. Of course this viewing audience is into Washington County and I think you're going to want to know about this race and who to decide so we'll try to get both of them on here or maybe just Julie Lafleur because I honestly I, I could care less about Susan Miles. I think she's not a good judge. I think she's a sexist. I think she has a hatred towards men. I don't know why a single man or uh, woman would vote for her uh, because you can't have a person who's a sexist for or against men. You can't have that type of person in the courtroom. If you think you want that, you're hurting yourself. Um, and that's my opinion on that, and I'll, I'll stand by it. Um, but I've experienced uh, her wrath in the courtroom, and I thought she was very unjust in what she did. Um, and then in the 10th Judicial District, but I think this is more in Sherburne County, Nancy Lagering is being challenged by Stacy Lashinsky. But you in Washington County, in these northern areas that our viewership goes into here, you may have a chance, you, you will vote on this race too, only though that seat, seat number 10, is out in Sherburne County. So just something to uh, keep in mind on these races here. Okay, but there's, there's where you go. There's where you can find out all about the races here in uh, on the judicial races in Minnesota. But you need to know what judicial district you're in. That's important. Our viewing audience, if you're in St. Paul, if you're in Ramsey County, you're the second judicial district. That's important to know. Ramsey County is the second judicial district. If you're in Washington, Anoka, Sherburne, Pine, uh, there's about six counties there, that's the 10th judicial district. And so you're gonna wanna look in those areas to find out where you're uh, judge is coming from. Okay, um, so we'll come back to this in a, in a while because we've got some other races I want to show you because we're going to mention some bad judges. But I want to uh, want you to watch a, a video from the Republican Party where uh, Dan Severson spoke. He's been a guest on this show and but you know I'm very clear about this. I am for Judge, <laughs> Judge Severson, uh, Dan Severson for Secretary of State. He has done so much to increase the integrity of our elections, and he's just a top-notch, outstanding man. And they played a video of him for the nomination, uh, which I just thought was fascinating. And you just get a good history of him, but you need to see this uh, because it just it just goes through his history and who he is. So here, let's watch it. My name is Eric Cardall, and I support Dan Severson for Secretary of State. My law practice is focused on subject areas involving litigation against the government. I've done dozens of cases. Over the last few years, though, my most notable cases have involved one public official, Secretary of State Mark Ritchie. In the constitutional amendment title cases, and in the recent online voter registration case, Mark Ritchie lost claims in the Minnesota courts. He is a serial violator of the law, and his office reflects that. We need a dramatic change. We need a countercultural implant offered by Dan Severson. With that change, we'll have a real opportunity for fair elections in Minnesota and having a Secretary of State's office with the integrity that's required. Right now, we need to stop the serial violator of the law and have someone who will enforce the law, like Dan Severson. I grew up in northern Minnesota, Hermantown area, family of six. I was the youngest of four. So when I was uh, four years old, I can remember being outside, looking up and hearing a one and hearing them go over. And it was just like, I'd rather be up there. I want to be up there. 
I would stick the chair on top of the bed and then uh, use the window as kind of the looking out the front of the cockpit and then lean to the right, lean to the left, and just imagine I was flying. That's the beauty of America, is that you can have a dream, you can have a passion, and uh, if you work hard, you can go after it, and you can achieve it. That's my beautiful wife. We met uh, on a blind date, actually, set up by both of our parents. Less than a year later, we were married. And we've been married for 39 years now, and it's been awesome. She's my partner. Yeah, I got two kids, and they're phenomenal kids. I'm gonna be a granddad. This is the first time. I'm excited. I'm excited. Watching my uh, son and uh, daughter-in-law interact with their new family member, and uh, it's kind of a mystery. It's kind of cool. Uh, it's an F-18 Hornet. I got approached by the Navy about flying, which was that dream. Flew that off the midway. Had about 270 traps off the midway. You're running low on fuel. Things start to get real interesting real quick because there's no place else to go. And so you end up being very good at what you do because you have to. After we got out of the military, we started in a startup company, planted a patent dealing with free space communications using light emitting diodes. Basically using visible light spectrum for communications. December 2001, ended up making an announcement for running for the Minnesota House of Representatives against an incumbent. We went through the nomination process and uh, we won the endorsement uh, after about 11 ballots, went on to win the uh, seat by 315 votes of over 15,000 casts. We worked hard. I door knocked the area about two and a half times, uh, met a lot of the constituents, had great conversations, and that's the beauty of representative government, that you get out there let people know who you are and gain their support. What I'm passionate about, I look for solutions for. I started an outreach to other communities. And those have all been great experiences because these are people that come to America with a, a vision of creating a better future for their families. Because these people, again, were refugees from a very dysfunctional government, came here and were largely quarantined into the Minneapolis, St. Paul area. And they said, you know what, we, we come here and the Democrats put us into Section 8 housing and then they put nonprofits all around us to keep us here. We just want to do business. So that was the beginnings of talking in that community about free market principles, talking about dreams and about government. That unless we link arms with these communities, we don't win another statewide race. No governor, no SOS, no auditor, no attorney general, no U.S. senator. In my opinion, Mark Ritchie has done a, a huge disservice to the people of Minnesota. And in uh, 2008, during that debacle, we had 554,000 same-day registrations. By Mark Ritchie's own admission, 17,000 of those had no resolution. They didn't know where they came from, they couldn't resolve it. But that was okay with him, even though Coleman lost by 321 votes. That was okay with him. That has changed the face of America because Minnesota has a corrupt election system. And because the Democrats have no interest in bringing justice or a light onto what has been empowering them for the last couple decades. All right, that was Dan Severson. I think he'll be a fantastic Secretary of State protecting people's right to vote uh, as, as and not disenfranchising people by allowing people to vote who aren't eligible to vote. So we'll see how that goes, but congratulations, Dan, for getting the uh, Republican Party endorsement. Uh, you're a good man. Uh, best wishes to you, absolutely. Okay, I want to go to a couple questions.
court cases that came up here in the Minnes Michigan Supreme Court. There's the, what's called this one parent doctrine. Okay, and that one parent doctrine is saying that um, if you're an unwed mother or father, uh, that the mother has claims to the children and has automatic claims, and the father's kind of pushed to the side. Um, but there's this father in Jackson County, Lance Laird, claimed his three children were kept away from him, even though he was never deemed to be an unfit parent. And this is a huge issue even in Minnesota here. You could never be deemed to be an unfit parent, yet you can't see your kids. And we've had Sandra Grazzini Rucky here, same thing, never deemed to be an unfit parent, yet her children are sitting in foster care right now and two are missing. Two of the five are missing. And the father doesn't have the children. Um, he gave them up to foster care. But she has never been deemed to have been unfit and has been trying to get her children. And Michelle McDonald has been an attorney who's running for the Minnesota Supreme Court. And it's just a travesty that she not being deemed unfit, can't see her children, can't have custody of her own children. It's, it's just beyond me, yet this happens in Minnesota over and over and over again. It's happening in Michigan because of this legal doctrine that has been adopted by many states. Uh, well, in this particular case, just after the, the last child was born of the couple, um, the infant tested positive for drugs. The mother uh, Tammy Sanders was found to be an unfit mother and the court removed all the children from both parents care. Now under current law on the books in Michigan for 70 year, years, Laird couldn't get the kids back so he took the issue to court. He couldn't get them even though he's never been deemed to be unfit. In a 5-2 to two opinion that was released uh, just this Monday, the high court said because the one parent doctrine allows the court to deprive a parent of the fundamental right to control the care and custody of a child, it is a violation of the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. So see here, they talk about it being a fundamental right. And, you know, I can see this case going to the U.S. Supreme Court. I hope it does because it in other cases, they, it is a high right, but the U.S. Supreme Court doesn't consider it a fundamental right. It's next to it, but just not quite. But either way, Mich Michigan says it is a fundamental right and because of the 14th Amendment and due process. So maybe Michigan is recognizing for the state of Michigan as a fundamental right that parents will have rights. Um, because if you understand, the U.S. Constitution lays down restrictions for the government and defines some of the rights that people have. All our rights are unalienable, don't need to be defined by our Constitution, but our Constitution does lay them out. It doesn't lay out parental rights, it doesn't need to. It's a common law practice. You're the parent, it's your child. You have responsibility, you take care of that child unless you are doing something that makes you an unfit parent and harming that child in some way that is spelled out in law that would be harm. And of course, we don't do that. We, we do it partially, but not fully. And so uh, the court also said, we recognize that the state has a legitimate and crucial interest in protecting the health and safety of minor children, right? That interest must be balanced, however, against the fundamental rights of a parent to parent their children. The decision, uh, and that's what, that's what the decision said. This, this is important here. This was about uh, single parents uh, and th that one parent having custody of his own kids when another parent was deemed unfit. This will also play into uh, marriage relationships for married parents who are going through a divorce and or parents in general. Uh, married parents that they have this fundamental right. So that's a huge decision by the Michigan Supreme Court. Uh, hopefully that won't be appealed from there. It will be set a law in Michigan. But we have a situation going on in the U.S. Supreme Court now that is 
uh, a decision that just came down last week. It's, it's called the Bond decision, and I wish I had the right name for it now. I left my stuff at home, but Bond versus so-and-so, but it's about a treaty. This lady uh, went out and terrorized her uh, ex-husband's paramour by putting chemicals on door handles and uh, all over some dwelling. And the paramour, that's the uh, ex-husband's uh, lover, uh, not, not the wife, uh, went and grabbed handles and got uh, skin irritation. So by that skin irritation, she, this uh, lady Bond, her last name Bond, was charged with terroristic threats and uh, violations of the Chemical Warfare, Warfare, Ban Warfare Treaty that bans the use of chemical weapons between nations. And the argument there, and you have to understand this is very important because we've showed the video of Michael Ferris arguing before the Senate Judiciary Committee, um, Subcommittee on Treaties, talking about the importance of a treaty and that the treaty on the conventions of the right of the child for uh, right of children, right of persons with disabilities, that treaty, the way it was written, would go in and decide laws for the state. And would, the states would be forced to change their laws to comply with the United Nations Treaty. And that is not the way treaties are meant to be. And in a 9-0 to zero decision, the U.S. Supreme Court said, no, uh, this treaty, you can't apply this treaty to this state here and, and this case uh, because uh, it should just be dealt with under state laws. There was nothing that happened between the nations. There was no chemical warfare between the nations. So, so the state must decide it. But there was a constitutional issue that was raised in this case, and that constitutional issue is that was addressed by three, three dissenting judge, Thomas, Alito, and uh, Scalia, they said, they, they answered the constitutional question, no, treaties cannot dictate what states do. The U.S. government can't sign a treaty, and therefore the federal government takes over states' rights. But uh, this treaty, uh, as the 9-0 to zero decision said, or or excuse me, it was a 6-3 decision that says, no, the federal government can at times sign treaties that would affect the states and how the states interact. This is a serious problem, okay? And this is an important reason why we need to sign, we need to have a constitutional amendment that makes parental rights a fundamental right. Um, and we need to put it in our Constitution so it's set a law that you as a parent get to raise your children in the education and upbringing of your choice. Because if these treaties come into place, like the treaties on uh, persons with disabilities or treaties on the Convention of the Rights of the Child, then countries like Uganda, like uh, Syria, like any, any of these countries that are part of the treaty can tell the state how to raise your child and your children. And no longer would we have the United States Constitution ruling over the family. We'd have the UN Constitution ruling over the family, which the UN Constitution does not recognize that the rights are given by God. It recognizes that the rights of, of the pe person is given by the state rather than by God. Okay, and this is a huge, huge problem uh, that needs to be addressed. The court brought it up, and so what's happened now in the U.S. Senate, one of the persons that's pushing this uh, treaty on the persons with rights of disability said, now bond has been decided, now we can go in, there's no problem with signing the treaty with the persons of right disability because it won't affect the states. But uh, Michael Ferris, who's, uh, who wrote an amicus brief, 
on the person's uh, on this bond case and said, "No, uh, you got to follow the constitutional rights here of the uh, of the individual and of the states." And Scalia, Thomas, and, and um, Alito said, "Yes, you're right. Uh, they they followed that brief and wrote a lot of what he said into the, their order." Uh, but so did the other side, but the other side didn't recognize the aspect that now uh, states, the uh, other countries' treaties uh, can come into effect the states. So this person is re-pushing this treaty because he doesn't think, well, he, he just thinks that uh, states can't, states don't have these rights anymore, so he's going to go push the treaty again and have it signed, try to have it signed before the year's out and before the elections, and therefore the persons with rights with disability will take away parental rights. And he just doesn't get it, he's wrong on that, so there's going to be a whole other uh, court case involved. Okay, um, so <clears throat> I'm going to play another, actually what I want to talk to you about here is that Michigan had three district court judges uh, have people running against them. And why do I bring up Michigan? I just want you to know that what happens in Minnesota happens in Michigan. Only Michigan seems to be a little bit more on top of, at least recently, of, of disciplining their judges. So one judge uh, is facing competition in an election. Rem remember, if there wouldn't be an election, these judges wouldn't have a chance to be held accountable by the people, okay? And the system hasn't held them accountable. But one judge, uh, Judge McKenzie, was sanctioned by a higher court in December after Oakland County prosecutors complained he was running a rogue court, filing, hiding files, hmm, haven't heard that here, and improperly dismissing domestic violent cases. Uh, he was sending defendants to a drug testing company that employed his son and had financial ties to his wife. Hmm, no, no conflict of interest there. And of course you saw the Georgia case and now there's a movie out about the Georgia case I'm seeing advertised on uh, TV about this judge in Georgia and, and how he sent 3,000 kids to uh, uh, this certain jail in order to get kickbacks and many of these kids were sexually molested by guards and and it's unbelievable it's just a horrific story uh, but that I think is a movie worth seeing I gotta find it and get it but realize you gotta realize judges are human also they're not any different than any of us out there no I mean we, we all you know, have to be responsible for what we do, but judges are human, they're not superhuman. They're just people. And, but if you put them in this high pedestal, you're hurting yourself and you're hurting your country. Uh, they need to be held accountable. And so, at least in Michigan, these, these judges are being ran against. Uh, another judge uh, was sued in 2009 after his court administrator notified state officials the judge was funneling hundreds of thousands of dollars in court money into private accounts. Um, Kandravas is the name of the judge. And then so when the court administrator uh, exposed that, this judge fired uh, the court administrator. <laughs> And then, uh, and then the court administrator sued the judge under the federal whistleblower status. That was settled for about 300000 <laughs> The judge had to pay back 300000 and the employee ended up getting 50000 out of it. Um, anyway, one other justice there. But I want to bring up in that light, in the 7th district, in the 7th judicial district, here, seat number 27, there's Stephen Cahill. And Stephen Cahill um, has been um, disciplined by the Board on Judicial Standards. It's a hand slap. The discipline is not much. He will be under supervision. But the issues they got on him is failure to follow the law. Uh, it lists a number of cases, one, two, three cases, four, seven cases in that. Improper ex parte orders, 
one, two, three, four, five, six cases on that. Chronic tardiness and related misconduct. Uh, number of cases on that. I mean, you go to the Board on Judicial Standards, just Google Board on Judi Minnesota Board on Judicial Standards, you're going to see all this uh, information uh, on this person. They basically have some uh, 22 complaints against the judge uh, with, uh, with those 22 being broken down. But he's still running for office. You understand, he'd still be a judge in, this, in that county if we didn't have elections but had retention elections or some other, which aren't elections, it's just an up or down vote. But there's three other people because of the bad press, not the bad press, who knows, it really hasn't got out in the press very much, but uh, there's three people running against him and there's a guy, Terry Graff, I'm going to have to follow up, I think I know who that is. Uh, uh, I'm going to have to know for sure and we'll see if we can get him on the show because uh, this Stephen Cahill's got to go. Uh, he's just not a good judge and you can see that the arrogance reading that decision of how he conducts a courtroom and what he's done to the people in front of him is not about administering justice but about himself uh, in my opinion. Okay, another case that was interesting of a judge um, that Scott was hand slapped by the Board on Judicial Standards is uh, Terrence M. Walters. He's the third judicial district judge. And this order came out uh, when April 22nd. But I'm finding out now uh, through people I know that live down in that area that a juror on a trial and somehow that juror has a little bit of an idea about the law but found out at least while he was watching there as a juror at least six due process violations that just this judge had been for, had performed and then also um, did a number of other um, bad behaviors in the courtroom, things that this juror did not like about the judge. So that person has filed a complaint with the Board on Judicial Standards after this discipline. Of course, when they, you get discipline, they watch you to find out how you're doing. Uh, within six months after the date of this reprimand becomes final, you will submit a report to the Board describing how you have complied with the foregoing conditions. Um, you will write a letter of apology to a person you did some wrong to. Uh, you will, in two months uh, after the reprimand becomes final, which is April 22nd, you will write a letter, of, uh, you will submit to the board and the mentor a proposed plan showing how you will address the causes of the misconduct described above. Uh, so April 22nd, May, June, so he hasn't even done that yet, and already we've got some other complaints against this judge. So, <laughs> not sitting in a good situation. Election will get him out of there, and we can start over. But it's a contested race. People can find out about the judges in that contested race, and then it would be a good thing to find out. Well, okay, we're going to... Uh, show another video here and oh uh, let's see if I can remember how to do this um, that wasn't it that wasn't it okay we have another video here and this is at the state convention and this is uh, Greg Wurzel uh, giving a campaign speech uh, a motion to nominate Michelle McDonald for the Minnesota Supreme Court. So we're going to watch what uh, he has to say. Command out, the control out. Okay. For the Minnesota Supreme Court that was endorsed by this convention in 2010, I had the uh, privilege of joining with the Republican Party in a lawsuit that went all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court back in 1996, 97, 98. 
And because of that lawsuit, judicial candidates can state their views on legal and political issues. They can attend political conventions such as this. And most importantly, this convention can endorse judicial candidates. Now, Ms. McDonald is going to be running against David Lillehug, with your, hopefully with your endorsement. If you are a member of the Tea Party, then I think you should want a candidate that believes in small government and government that is responsible to the people. Then I encourage you to endorse Michelle McDonald. And if you are a, libertary, a liberty Republican, then surely you want judges that believe in your rights to be free of government interference in your private property and in your person. Michelle McDonald believes that your castle is your home and that the government has been overreaching in its use of the police power to grab private property simply to increase property taxes. And she believes that the federal courts have been delinquent and haven't been protecting the, the rights of the citizens against unreasonable searches and seizures. And she believes that we must use the state constitution and our state courts to protect those rights. And if you, and if you are a social conservative, then I want to bring to your attention that there is no affront so severe against the right of life as the current order that exists where the Minnesota Supreme Court requires each of us as taxpayers to pay for abortions. I urge you to endorse a pro-life candidate for the Minnesota Supreme Court, Michelle McDonald. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if you believe in the Constitution, and if you want to stop judicial activism, then you need to endorse Michelle McDonald. Now some say that Michelle has been controversial in the past because she's gotten into arguments with judges because, well, they failed to uphold your rights. Well, you know what I say? That's just the kind of person we need on the court. I nominate Michelle McDonald because she is a strong woman and she's a strong conservative, and she is going to fight and fight and fight. I give you your next justice to the Minnesota Supreme Court, Michelle McDonald. All right. Gentlemen, my name... Oops, sorry. Well, that's a good introduction there uh, to Michelle McDonald, but also what, what the issues are at hand here uh, for this election. You want, a, you want a judge that supports the Constitution. And one of Greg's Wurzel cases he was talking about there is about Doe versus Gomez, a complete violation of your religious liberties and uh, having a right of conscience. Where you, now everybody's being forced to pay for abortions in Minnesota. Totally unconstitutional. But hey, our. Minnesota Supreme Court, in all their wisdom, decided that was okay. And uh, it's not. But it's the same reason we're paying for, uh, uh, it's kind of the same thing why we're paying for the Viking Stadium, you know, which is the new religion here, uh, <laughs> the neo-religions that are out there, where they're forcing people to pay for somebody's private organization. Unconscionable. But that's where we're at here in Minnesota. I don't know where Michelle would line up on that issue. There's no court case that came before uh, the Minnesota Supreme Court on that issue. Um, but people, you got to think about uh, our Constitution that we're not out to create cults like the Minnesota Vikings are now. We're not out to create new religions. We're out to let people decide who to associate. Not, not this forced association like the Maplewood Community Center that year after year is financially broke, yet they, because they can take your tax money, they can keep going, and they're forcing you to associate with the Maplewood Community Center. It's, it, it's just unconscionable, but that's the mindset of the people here, and it's dangerous, and we'll go down this slope, and we already have, 
that we can start telling you who you have to associate with and who, who you got to start paying for. And so, uh, you know, realize here, I am a, I'm a big football fan. I played football. I like the game. Uh, I will never play it again. <laughs> Too old for that. But it, it's, it's about freedom of association and forcing people who don't like football to have to pay for it. You know, or who like football but like Kansas City better than Minnesota. And you're forcing them to pay for uh, the Minnesota team instead of the Kansas City team. Uh, it's un unbelievable. But th that's the concept there. Well, we're going to show you a little the, the speech that Michelle gave here at the convention. So let's, let's play this. Thank you, Greg Wurzel, and coming from somebody who has been endorsed several times by the Republican Party, that means a lot to me. Thank you. Well, I am Michelle McDonald, and I am running for Supreme Court Judge of the State of Minnesota. Now, did you ever wonder why when a judge enters a courtroom, you hear the words, All rise. Let me tell you why. When judges used to enter the courtroom, they would hold a Bible over their head like this. In the words of George Washington, is it, it is impossible to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. <laughs> Court orders by judges are daily affecting the lives and constitutional and civil rights of millions of Americans. It is a matter of profound importance to all people parents, children, families, and you, that I, as an individual, an attorney, and judge, uphold your fundamental liberty rights. The entire social and political structure of Minnesota and America rests upon the cornerstone that we the people have certain rights which are inherent. That means we do not have to go to lawmakers or courts to obtain those rights, but we turn to lawmakers and courts to protect and reinforce our rights. These are the rights such as to protect ourselves, our liberty, our life, our liberty with our resources, our property, our family, and our pursuit of happiness. I will, as your Supreme Court Justice, protect and defend your right to establish a home, family relations, to acquire, possess, and enjoy your property. I will protect and reinforce the rights of all of us that we, you know, by use of equal and impartial laws which govern all of us. Judges unquestionably have significant influence over your lives your hopes, your dreams, and your accomplishments. Let me repeat. Judges unquestionably have significant influence over your lives, your hopes, your dreams, and your accomplishments. As state court judge, I will uphold my obligation not to interpret laws, to allow violations of your civil and constitutional rights and fundamental law. Yeah. 
I will not deny any person's right to equal justice under the law. I am committed to civil liberties, constitutional rights, human dignities, and fair and treatment of all citizens, children or adults. I am admitted as an attorney in the United States Supreme Court of America. As your Supreme Court Justice, I promise to be accountable to the highest court in the land, which is the court of the people, all of you. God bless you. God bless your children. God bless your family. And let's all ask God to bless America again. All right. There's Michelle McDonald. I tell you what, um, I've read her brief. Uh, she wrote an amicus brief, uh, Rue v. Bergstrom, on 50-year restraining orders where the court took her side, uh, except David Lillyhog, who she's running against. Uh, you got a, a man with no abuse allegations against his kids, but has a 50-year restraining order on that. And the brief she wrote in that was just remarkable. Uh, it was fantastic. Everything you would want to have as a parent uh, to defending your rights over your children and it's it was it was great it was fantastic I've read a n read a number of our other briefs uh, they are fantastic in protecting the family uh, and protecting that parent-child relationship um, and she's a stand-up person she's been on this show protecting parents and we've told you the Sandra Grazzini Rocky story uh, but there's other stories out there too uh, another um, case she was dealing with was, uh, well, I, it just uh, went from my mind, also before the Minnesota Supreme Court. Uh, and uh, she was on the winning side of that also. But that was, you know, she, she writes on this stuff. She knows it. She knows it well. And she is not afraid to go against judges who are, rogue judges who are violating due process and violating the law like Judge Knutson in Dakota County. Now Michelle McDonald, she's been on our show and she was held in contempt of court by Judge Knutson. Uh, and you know down at the Republican Party convention there was discussion about that. Well you can't have somebody running for the Supreme Court that would do such a thing as to earn a contempt of court. Those things aren't given out lightly. You know, well and this is coming from an attorney. And you know what? Baloney. They, they are given out. They can be given out very lightly, and it depends on the judge, and especially a judge that's trying to cover up uh, for their mistakes and trying to send a message that you better not expose what I'm doing in this courtroom or you're going to be punished. And that judge tried to do that. Well, Michelle was charged with contempt of court, and she had... Uh, went through the process and another judge says, hey, look, there's no probable cause here that you should charge her with this. I would have liked to have seen a trial out there so this could have gotten more, more coverage. But the, the judge was out of line. The judge issued an oral warrant. It's, he was told something happened in his courtroom that he did not see that he was not in the courtroom had, did not have experience with, and then Judge Knutson issued an oral warrant. You can't issue oral warrants as a judge if you have not seen what was taking place and it wasn't in front of you and it wasn't in the courtroom where you were. Yet he did it. And on that deposition and uh, pretrial stuff, the couple of these sheriffs said, yeah, it happens all the time. Hello, there's a problem in Dakota County, and it's an ethos in our court system that this type of behavior takes place and happens, and there needs to be an investigation into that. Well, hey, I want, a, I want an attorney, I want a Supreme Court justice that understands the fallacies of our court system and is willing to expose them because these Supreme Court justices, they write the rules. 
they write the rules of the court and they let you know what goes on and they they define how that courtroom works the other thing that happens and I think Michelle's been fighting for this, is that you get cameras in the courtroom, recordings of what takes place. And they do have cameras in the courtroom, but you have to subpoena them if you're being charged. And it's fortunately, and we're going to get the video of when Michelle was arrested for this contempt of court to show how they treated her uh, uh, during this thing, a citation. It's a citation, you know, in the way that's done. Here's your citation, here's your court date, we'll, we'll be back. Um, it's, a, it's amazing. Uh, but there is video of that, and we'll get that out uh, to you when we, when we find it. So understanding this, she understands what happens in the court. But, but another thing that will be coming out, and we're about out of time. I'm going to do this real quick, uh, start playing the music. <laughs> Here's the deal. She was charged with a DUI and had a blood test of 00, 0.00. The case should be thrown out. She was not drunk, no drugs, no alcohol, yet she's still being charged and there's still court date September 21st, something like that. She, she's experienced, she knows what's going on. She's been attacked by the courts herself. I think she's perfect for the Minnesota Supreme Court. Remember, if you don't stand up for other people's liberties, who's gonna stand up for yours? Good men, don't do nothing. God bless. You said to me that you wouldn't leave, but now I see that you're long gone. Sets on fire